screen. I see it. Let me just uh, check the technical, make sure it's working. Yep, it's working. So go ahead. <laughs> Okay, excellent. Um, well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for participating today and thank you very much to Vicki for setting this up. Um, it's always a wonderful opportunity for myself to kind of demystify the program, as Vicki said. Um, so I'm really happy to do that today, to provide you with more information and then to field any questions that you do have at the end of the session. Um, so to kick off and kind of what Vicki said, in terms of the program, this is working. there we go. Um, I think it's important to start and take kind of a step back and look at the macro view. Um, so some of you may know that the Fulbright <laughs> Specialist Program is one of over a dozen programs that actually feed into the larger Fulbright Program. The larger Fulbright program was founded shortly after World War II in 1946 and is sponsored by the U.S. Department of State. And really at the, the heart of the Fulbright program, it's about increasing mutual understanding between people of the United States and people abroad through educational exchange. In the 70 years since its founding, the Fulbright program has provided exchange opportunities to almost 400,000 participants in over 100 countries. So it really is the flagship program of the U.S. Department of State. So more specifically with the Fulbright Specialist Program, this is one of the newer programs. It was established in 2001. Uh, World Learning serves as the implementing partner of the program on behalf of the State Department. Um, so World Learning is a nonprofit organization based in Washington, DC. And the basic structure of the program is that U.S. academics and professionals complete short-term projects of two to six weeks that are actually designed by host institutions abroad. So this is a really unique model. Some of you may be familiar with um, the Fulbright Scholar Program, for example, that really can focus on helping you pursue your own individual research interests. But the specialist program is really about, you know, serving the goals and priorities of host institutions abroad, as they are really the entities and the drivers of the projects themselves. Um, and so you would really be going to support those projects in almost a consultancy capacity. Uh, the program operates in over 150 countries, so it really does touch kind of every corner of the globe. Um, and we implement over 400 grants on a rolling basis year round. So why might you want to participate? It's really an excellent opportunity to gain some cross-cultural professional development and international exposure. In addition, it's really an opportunity for you to potentially spark a new relationship or new engagement between yourself and potentially even your employer in the US, as well as with the institution abroad. Um, a lot of our return grantees even talk about the fact that they were really able to gain a new perspective on their own field and sector as a result of participating. And when you return to the US, you become a Fulbright alumni and you get to access really a global network of individuals as part of that, which can certainly help contribute to you know, your career development and progression uh, for many years to come. Okay, great. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the financial support that the program provides and specifically what does the program provide and what does what what is expected of the, the fellow that goes abroad? Um, and I'm also particularly interested to know about housing, how housing works, since I've heard that that's provided. But what does that mean in different countries? 
Yeah, no, that's a great question. So, you know, in general, participation of specialists should not cost you any kind of out of pocket expenses. This is really a fully funded opportunity for the Americans who participate as the specialist. Um, so the, the kind of the financial benefits are divided by two different parties. Uh, so first, the State Department provides funding for your international flight, um, $100 transit allowance to get you to and from the airport in the US, a $200 a day honorarium for your time, as well as a limited health benefits uh, plan. Conversely, the host institution um, locally in the country abroad, they actually traditionally provide um, your lodging, meals, and in-country transportation. And I think this is actually a really great model for the program because as you can see, these institutions are putting their own funding into this project. So they very much have you know, some skin in the game, some ownership over, um, you know, the impact of it because they are putting in their own money. Right, right. Uh, in, in terms of your question, Vicki, about lodging, uh, lodging definitely varies from grant to grant. Um, it depends on what sort of resources um, that particular host institution may have access to. So, for example, a lot of universities abroad may have faculty guest housing, and so you would stay perhaps on campus um, with other individuals. Alternatively, um, other universities and nonprofits and other organization types that might not have that resource, in most cases they would then put you into a local hotel. Um, and it's important to note that when these projects are going through the approval of process by both the U.S. Embassy and the State Department, those entities are reviewing the accommodations and arrangements that the host institutions are proposing. Okay. So you can rest assured that uh, multiple stakeholders are assessing the feasibility and safety, you know, all, all of those really important considerations around the final lodging arrangements. I see. Now, if you were going to a developing country where, you know, they may, you know, the housing that they provide either maybe isn't at a standard that you would be, you know, comfortable with, or they, they maybe the host that you're working or trying to work with can't afford to provide you lodging and meals um, during two to six weeks because it's just too expensive. Is that something that a specialist could take on themselves if they really want to do it? Or could it not even get into the system if that was the case? Yeah, really great question. So the State Department does prohibit any self-funding by specialists. Um, one of the reasons that they do that is they want to make sure that this program is really accessible to all Americans and not just those who might have the financial resources to okay. self-fund their participation. Um, in some limited cases, if host institutions are unable to provide the cost share, but the U.S. Embassy or the State Department believes that that project also really closely aligns with their own priorities for that particular country, in some limited cases, those entities might put their own funding forward and will pay for those in-country expenses. Um, but And that typically only happens, I think, to your point, Vicki, in developing countries. Right. Um, but about 95% of projects, the host institutions are providing uh, the required cost share. Okay. And do people ever bring family on these, um, you know, short-term stints? Is that possible or... Yeah, that's a really great question. You know, a lot of people might be used to some of the longer Fulbright programs that have more dependent um, financial support available. Unfortunately, given the short term nature, you know, just two to six weeks, um, the State Department does not provide any dependent support. Um, so, you know, for example, they won't be able to purchase the, the airfare mm -hmm. or, you know, accommodate them in lodging. Um, so while uh, Individuals certainly do bring their family members, and we make sure that that is 
approved with the host institution and the embassy uh, just to make sure, especially if they're bringing minor dependents, that those arrangements have been taken care of. Okay. Um, but there is really no financial or administrative support for dependents. Okay. So it's sort of on you. If you did want to bring your spouse or kids or something, even for some period of that time, it, you, it's sort of on you to fund that, figure that out, um, make sure there's visas and things of that sort. Of, so Exactly. Okay. Very, very good to know. Um, let's go on to the next question. So where can you tell me more about the host institutions? Where can you be hosted? Uh, you talked about universities, but I know some people are interested in other types of nonprofits, NGOs, uh, companies. So I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me just skip over here. Let me skip to this one first. So there are several different types of host institutions that are eligible for the program. Uh, so first, certainly kind of the, the traditional Fulbright audience that we often associate these projects with. So institutions of higher education, universities, colleges. Um, but the program also does um, have projects that take place at government institutions. So we commonly see projects at ministries of education or ministries of health. Um, projects also take place with cultural institutions, so museums. Um, several times we've had national libraries, which is the <laughs> Um, Nonprofit <laughs> organizations or NGOs are often um, also, they're also eligible and do take advantage of the program. And then finally, uh, medical institutions such as teaching hospitals um, are also eligible. Okay, great. And I think there was a slide you had about the types of fields that any of these projects yes. can be in. I kind of, it seems pretty broad actually. So if you want to go yeah, backwards. <laughs> Can jump back to that quick. Um, yes, so it is fairly broad. So there's over 20 different uh, disciplines or fields that uh, projects can be um, uh, take place kind of within those umbrellas. So everything from agriculture to economics, political science, urban planning. Uh, so these projects end up being uh, tremendously diverse depending on the specific needs and priorities of the host institutions. Okay. Is there any special uh, project areas that are really um, sort of of interest to the, to the program right now? Yeah, no, it's, it's funny you say that. I was just uh, talking about this with the State Department yesterday. We've really seen an uptick of interest among host institutions abroad um, and projects in cybersecurity. Mm. So if any of you are cybersecurity experts, um, you should certainly consider uh, applying to the program. We've really seen an increased interest, um, not only from universities that maybe have computer science programs and cybersecurity as part of that, um, but we've also seen um, some local government entities abroad who are interested in kind of strengthening their own cybersecurity architecture and are looking for a specialist to support. So that has been um, kind of a, one of those hot topics that has has come up quite a bit. Oh, that's super interesting. Okay, good to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's get into the next. Um, well, one thing I want to ask about the host institutions is there is there any kind of what are the main differences if you were say hosted by a university versus a nonprofit organization? Do the universities have more of an in to this program because historically that's who it is or can you work with a nonprofit? Yeah, no, great question. You can absolutely work with a nonprofit. Um, the majority of host institutions, probably about 80% still kind of within that traditional audience of institutions of higher education. And I think that probably a lot of that has to do with that tends to be the audience that's most familiar with the Fulbright program. Right. Um, so they're kind of already in the know, whereas reaching out to nonprofits and ministries, um, that can take the U.S. embassies or Fulbright commissions in those countries a little bit more time to make some inroads in marketing the program. Um, but absolutely, we do have uh, nonprofits participating every year. Kind of all of those categories that I talked about previously, um, we do have active host institutions um, annually from those categories. So um, it definitely, they are taking advantage, but the traditional audience is still most dominant. 
Yeah, and I know that if universities have hosted a, a specialist before, they're very familiar with the system, the bureaucracy and everything that's involved. If you're trying to work with a new host institution that's never hosted a Fulbright specialist and is not in the system, can you give a quick overview of like what they have to do on their end to get into the system? Yeah, absolutely. So the each country um, has a certain allotment of projects that it's allowed to support each year. And that allotment is determined by the U.S. Department of State. And each country is overseen the, either by the Fulbright Commission for that country or the U.S. Embassy. And that entity, um, at its discretion, gets to determine how it runs its country competition. Mm -hmm. So some countries that have a really well-established program, they often have a very defined competition period. Um, you know, maybe they might have one or two competition cycles for the year. Other countries um, decide to review um, projects on a rolling basis. So they, at the country level, not for we're learning here on the U.S. side, it's really the embassy and Fulbright commissions that are running those competitions and that are supporting host institutions and their project proposals. Okay. Um, but at kind of the very base level, if there is a host institution that's interested, what we always do is we recommend that they, before starting their project proposal, which is an online application process, that they um, reach out to and connect with either the participating U.S. Embassy or the Fulbright Commission. So that way that they really truly understand what is the competition period look like for that country, are there any additional requirements that that entity has chosen to apply for that, that particular country context? Um, it really just makes for a smoother process versus just submitting, you know, an application through the online system mm -hmm. without having made that connection. Okay. I think that's important for people who are interested in this program to know that it's quite a bit of work on the, on the host institutions end to make sure they're adequately getting into the system, that they're following the rules, um, and that also that there's limited spots per country. So there's no guarantee that the project will be accepted if there's already a, a queue of other projects. Um, so it's always good to know. And that maybe if you're really interested in doing this program, it might be good to look at programs that are already have had a Fulbright specialist before because they will already be in the system and, and acquainted with it. So it could be a little bit quicker of a matching process. We'll talk more about the, the matching because I know there's a lot more um, to talk about, um, but maybe I think your next slides, I, I wanted to talk about like the types of projects that people do over two to six weeks. We talked about the fields. Maybe you could give yeah. a few examples of, a, of an adequate project for such a short period. Of course. Um, so in looking again at what are some of the, you know, traditional project activities, one of the common threads for all projects, even across all these different diverse disciplines and sectors, is that there has to be an education or training component. Um, so some common activities might be delivering a seminar or a workshop for either faculty members, if it's at a university, or for a specific department, for example, if it's at a nonprofit organization. Um, it could be developing um, curriculum materials um, or other academic training materials. Oftentimes, we will have specialists that are lecturing at either the graduate or undergraduate level if they're participating at a university. Um, many institutions look for someone to come in to complete a needs assessment or an evaluation, once again, either for their nonprofit organization or perhaps for um, an academic department at a university. Um, and we've also seen kind of an uptick in universities that are really interested in internationalizing um, different aspects of their institutions. We've seen a lot more projects in that regard, um, as well as some universities that are interested in a very particular accreditation process, and they'd love some support in that. Um, so again, the, the range of activities that falls under this is very broad. There just has to be that training or education component. Um, so to make this a little bit more tangible, um, just to give you a couple examples, uh, we had a recent specialist, uh, Dr. Patrick Dobson of the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Uh, he is an expert in geothermal energy, 
and he completed a project in Mexico for the Center for Scientific Investigation in Higher Education and in Ensenada. And he basically provided seminars to this institution's scientists on geothermal um, exploration and production. And then he took it a step further by also training some of their students and technicians and took them to a geothermal field to practice some gas collection methods. Um, so you can see that they were very tangible um, uh, activities and that's really it's really important because there's only two to six weeks so we know that time goes very quickly and really as a result of this initial exchange um, Dr. Dobson and uh, his host institution have been working very closely together to execute an MOU and to bring some of the technicians from that host institution in Mexico to his home laboratory to continue collaborating and training together. Um, and that's really a great example of hopefully these projects are kind of the spark that then allows both parties to see the value in kind of continued collaboration. When, when you're selecting projects um, to be matched with a specialist, is, it, is if a project seems too ambitious to be done in two to six weeks, is that like a big knock against the project? Or do you, do you write back feedback like this is way too ambitious for six weeks? Or is it just rejected? Or what happens if that happens? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, when the projects are submitted, the first reviewer is either the U.S. Embassy or the Fulbright Commission, whichever entity is administering the program for that country. And then if they approve it, it then goes to the State Department, where it goes through another round of approvals. And it's quite often where perhaps the project objectives and activities are, you know, too lofty for the actual timeline. Um, and it's very common for either of those entities, whether it's the embassy or the State Department, um, to seek clarification and to ask for revisions um, to have a slightly more feasible or realistic um, set of activities that would fit within the timeline before the project will be approved. Okay. Um, so that is very common. Okay, very good. Um, and so for a project like this, I mean, what if you wanted to go to a country and do your stint, do two or three stints so that you could do like a longer term project? Is that possible to go, like, could this guy go to Mexico three times if he wanted to? Yeah, that's a great question. So the program does allow for multi-visit projects. Um, multi-visit projects can be up to three visits. Each visit has to be a minimum of 14 days, and all projects combined, uh, all visits combined, excuse me, cannot exceed 42 days. So even if it's a multi-visit, um, you won't actually exceed that maximum of, of six weeks in total. Oh, I see, I see. Um, yeah. But it, it can't be more than six weeks because of the, the funding and the infrastructure of it. Exactly, exactly. And I would say only about 10% of projects are multi-visit. So when the host institution is developing the project proposal, that's one of the, the questions that they answer of whether or not this will be a single visit or a multi-visit. Okay. Um, I'm getting a little bit into the weeds here, but one of yeah. the reasons that only about 10% of projects end up being multi-visit is that there is higher cost associated with that, of course. It's multiple flights that have to be purchased, right. multiple administrative costs. And so as a result, when it comes to the country level, each project visit counts against each country's allocation as one, visit, as one project. See. So if you have three visits, that counts as three projects for that U.S. Embassy or Fulbright Commission. So a lot of those entities don't always want to support those projects because then it's one or two less projects that they can support overall. So okay. I know that's getting a little bit into the weeds. No, but, but it's good for, for people to know um, that this isn't like a, a long, not necessarily like a long term thing that you're going to go back multiple times funded, um, that maybe it is better to aim for the six week Four to, four to six weeks um, in your first go. And then hopefully you have other funding sources to maintain a long-term relationship if if you were able to do that. So, um, okay, I know we're already at uh, half an hour, so let's keep going. Um, so actually next, tell us more about eligibility criteria. 
Um, and is this specialist program only for people with PhDs and terminal degrees, academics, or, you know, I've heard you say it's for professionals. What does that mean exactly? Yeah, absolutely. Let me skip ahead here. Um, so I love your question about whether or not you have to have a PhD or a terminal degree. Um, you absolutely do not. There's no minimum education uh, requirement for the program. Um, and one of the reasons is, you know, depending on your sector or field, it may not make sense um, for you to have a terminal degree. That might not actually be necessary for you to you know, be a leading uh, professional in your industry. So you know, we often see that with fields such as engineering. Um, we certainly have engineers. Um, we just sent um, an engineer from IBM to Kosovo who worked on a project. Um, this also often applies to individuals who are more from, you know, the fine arts. So uh, we have projects focused on dance and theater. Um, and certainly, you know, a terminal degree would not be uh, necessary um, for those sorts of industries. Um, and even if you are, you know, for example, um, when we think about universities, we often think about participating faculty members, but we also have a lot of administrators who participate as well. I had mentioned before that we're increasingly seeing projects that universities abroad want to learn how to internationalize their, their campuses um, and their efforts. And a lot of times their counterparts aren't necessarily faculty members in the U.S. who are always overseeing those initiatives on U.S. campuses, but rather are administrators who may or may not have a terminal degree. So that is definitely not a requirement. Um, some specific requirements are you do have to be a U.S. citizen. Um, you do have to have, the phrasing here is significant experience in your respective field. And now a lot of people ask us, well, what do we mean by significant experience? Um, and people are always going to push me for a number of years <laughs> <laughs> what that means, because, uh, you know, it, people can interpret that differently. Um, I would say, in general, if you would twist my arm and say, yeah, I have to give you a number of years, you know, I would say we see most people have at least five years of experience in their specific field. Um, and of course, that is because you are kind of coming to serve in a consultancy capacity. So you do need to have um, developed, you know, that base knowledge um, in order to be able to, to really share and, and have impact. Um, that said, you know, sometimes I think there's this misperception that, you know, you have to be, you know, at the end of your career with 40 years of experience. Um, and that's just not necessarily true. We have seen kind of the whole gamut of individuals who participate. I, I think our youngest participant last year was 25 um, and our oldest was 92. Wow. So, really runs the course. Um, and I think especially for those individuals who are mid-career, I think one of the great things about them participating is the linkages that they're establishing then have, you know, multiple decades really uh, to continue to grow and to support, you know, versus somebody who is at perhaps the end of their career. Um, now that said, those individuals also have decades of knowledge and wisdom to share. So that is a whole other, you know, um, impact as well. So really, uh, if you've got a specific knowledge or skill set that you think is relevant to institutions abroad, I would highly encourage you to, to consider applying. Well, this does sound like a great um, fellowship you could do as you're retired, you know, because you, um, I get a lot of questions about, well, what can I do at retirement age um, for fellowships? There's not that many opportunities geared toward retired people, but this could be a great one. I mean, if you've worked for 40 years in your industry and you have so much knowledge to share and lots of time on your hands. I mean, this could be an extraordinary way to share that globally. So good to keep in mind. Great. Let's get on to the next questions. Uh, okay. Now let's get into the nitty gritty. Tell us about this application process. Um, you know, I've heard that you have to get on the roster. Uh, and I think that process I, from what I understand has changed a little bit, but um, tell us about getting on the roster. And then like, once you're on the roster, then what happens? Yes, absolutely. Um, 
So for those of you who are unfamiliar with what is the roster, how does this function? So the Fulbright Specialist roster is basically a pre-vetted group of individuals who are eligible to be matched to specialist projects that are designed by the host institutions abroad. So when you are applying to participate in the program, you're not applying for a specific project opportunity, but rather you're applying to join the roster and so that you then are eligible. The reason that the State Department has set up the application process this way is because the projects are driven by the host institutions and they are submitted on a rolling basis throughout the year, we don't know day to day what is the knowledge and skills that are going to be needed for any given project. And so this way, by already having a group of individuals who have undergone uh, the assessment process, we can make those matches um, very quickly, um, especially if a project has a particular um, quick turnaround. So that's kind of why this is structured the way it is. So the first step, if you're interested, would be to submit an online application. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And once your application is submitted, it would be assessed by a peer review <laughs> panel. And if the peer review <laughs> panel approves you, then you would receive a tenure on the roster of three years, during which time you're eligible to be matched to projects. So if you're interested, um, the first step again is to really start with your application. So if you visit our website at fulbrightspecialist.worldlearning.org, um, you will see that we have several apply buttons. We have plastered it all over the website, so you can't miss it. Um, so you would click on the apply button, and then it would take you to our online application platform. Once you're on that platform, you would select the new user link, and then you can self-register and begin your application. The application is pretty consistent with what you would probably expect. So we're going to be asking for your education and employment history. There's two essays. Um, you provide your resume. You also have an opportunity, if you're interested, in expressing any geographic preferences for where you might want to conduct a project. Um, if you have proficiency in a second language, you're able to um, provide that information to us. And then also, we get contact information from you for three professional references. Um, and basically, that's collecting um, their name, their relationship to you, and their email address. And once you hit the submit button, um, our system will automatically send them an email with a link to complete an online reference form. So they don't actually have to complete a separate uh, letter of reference for you. They'll complete an online form. Um, and just please note that until we have at least two of those three references received, your application is not considered complete. Now, just in terms of the essays, if you're curious and you want to start kind of planning and getting an idea, um, the first essay is really about you describing why you're interested in serving as a Fulbright specialist, how your participation would benefit a host institution abroad, um, as well as your institution or employer in the US. Um, and you have an opportunity to articulate really specific activities um, that you might like to engage in or specific knowledge and skills that you believe you could share. The second essay is really about you describing any previous experience you have in an international environment and why you believe you could be effective working with an institution abroad. And I think it's important to note that we also want people who don't have previous international experience, as in many cases, this you know, program might be even more impactful for you. Mm -hmm. So if you don't, please don't um, shy away from applying. We give you the opportunity in that essay to say, no, I don't have it, but these are the strategies that I would employ in order to be successful in a cross-cultural context. Oh, that's great. I like to hear that you're encouraging people with limited to no international experience. This doesn't mean it's not a knock against you. It's actually a good thing. Um, 
because I know, I mean, a lot of people that n know about international fellowships, you know, they'll put this on as one another thing they want to do. But, um, you know, this is also another great avenue for people who haven't done a fellowship or gone abroad or studied abroad. Another great way to have an international experience with your skills. Yeah. And, you know, another common question we get is, you know, I'm not proficient in a second language. Is that going to hurt my odds of being matched to a project? And I would say absolutely not. Um, and probably 96, 97 percent of projects, um, they are conducted fully in English. It's a very minimal amount of projects, two to three percent, that are um, that would really require proficiency in a second language. Um, and among those projects, the most commonly requested language skills are Spanish and French or Arabic. So if you do have those language skills, um, that's excellent. And certainly you would be very competitive for those projects. Um, but if you don't, please rest assured that the majority of projects do not require it. That's great. Did we have more slides on this roster or? Um, One more. Yeah, tell us a bit more about the peer review. So once you've submitted your project, or excuse me, your application, it then goes through the peer review process, which some of you may be um, familiar with if you've done other Fulbright applications. Um, because the program is, you know, rolling year round, we try to make sure that the peer review process happens uh, quite frequently so that we're continuing to get new individuals on the roster. Um, so right now we administer peer review panels six times a year and the peer review panels are comprised of three individuals from your same general field. 98% um, of peer reviewers right now are actually returned Fulbright specialists um, themselves. So they're very well positioned to, um, to really assess the applications um, and make sure that the roster is primed with individuals who are really ready to go and, and make an, an impact. So, you know, the panels are looking at things such as professional qualifications, cross-cultural skills, adaptability, and kind of how well you've, you know, articulated overall the benefits um, of your participation to different stakeholders. That's good. Is there any anything like an applicant, um, what, what are some any big mistakes you see that people make in this application process? Yeah, I think the biggest mistake I see people make is, you know, everybody is very busy. And I'm sure for a lot of people who are looking at different grant opportunities, they're, they're filling out, you know, a multitude of these applications each year. And so sometimes I think people fall into the trap of because as part of the application, I'm uploading my resume or my CV that's going to speak for itself. I'm clearly distinguished in my field. You know, I've got decades of experience. Um, and really, the peer reviewers look very closely at the essays. And if you don't spend a lot of time on those essays and you just hope that your resume will speak for itself, that is the number one reason I see people get denied. Um, because the peer review panel really wants to make sure that you understand the Fulbright Specialist Program, what it is, and that your motivations really align with the program goals. And even if that's the case, but you haven't taken the time to clearly articulate it, um, that is often going to result in a denial. So I think that's the biggest thing I can say is really be thoughtful and take the time to put your essays together. Oh, uh, that's a great, great tip. I think people forget how important that the essays typically in almost any fellowship application is the most important component. Um, and that, you know, people need to speak to your mission, which is the international, the cultural exchange. Um, it's not so much you and your personal goals, but really the goals of the program. So thank you for bringing that up. That's a good point. Um, now for, uh, the next part is this, I think this is the part that gets the most confused is about the matching process. And also, you know, uh, this question of, do you pick or propose the country or do you get matched or could you do either? So tell us more about that part of it where the project and the specialists get matched. Yeah, absolutely. So once you get on the Fulbright Specialist roster, the same day that you receive your acceptance letter from Apple, <coughs> you will receive access to an online portal. Within that online portal, our team on almost a daily basis, because of all the projects coming in, um, we 
provide an overview of all of the current projects that need to be matched with a specialist. So you'll get an opportunity to actually go in and see um, the, the project proposal that the host institution has put together. So what are the project activities, the, the timeline for the project, the project goals, and if you are interested in that project, if you think you would be a good fit, you then get to express your interest um, through the portal. You can upload an updated CV, provide a short uh, statement of interest of why this specific project intrigues you and why you'd like to be considered. Um, and so that is one way to really kind of express your interest um, for a particular project. What we do then is once we've gotten um, the interest that's been generated through the portal, we package everything up and we share it with uh, the U.S. Embassy or Fulbright Commission, whichever entity is overseeing that country, um, and they share it with the host institution. And the host institution is ultimately the entity that gets to determine which individual they think is the best fit. Um, so some of the, the criteria they're going to be looking at is, you know, of course, the degree of relevancy of your professional and academic experience, um, foreign language proficiency, and those minority of cases where that might be a requirement, um, and then whether or not your availability matches what the host institution is looking for. Um, once the host institution identifies its top candidate from those who express their interest, uh, we then facilitate um, a phone call or a Skype call between the host and that individual so that both parties can talk together um, and really confirm that uh, you know, expectations are in alignment and that this project works for both parties before that match is finalized. So you're never forced to go on a project that you're not interested in mm -hmm. or you know, if ultimately the project proposal, you know, what is written there, it doesn't mirror your conversation with the host institution, you know, you're not backed into a corner. We try to make sure that everything is always, you know, workable for both sides. Alternatively, please note that host institutions can also request a specific individual uh, to serve on a project if they already have a pre-existing relationship or if they've received a recommendation from a colleague, for example. Um, and where that would be indicated is in their actual project proposal that they, again, submit to the Embassy or Fulbright Commission. Uh, they could add your name there. Um, please just note that just because a host institution puts a name and recommends an individual, that individual still has to go through the roster process, the full application process, and if they are not admitted to the roster, um, they will not be permitted to serve as the specialist for that project. Um, so those are the two primary methods through which matching gets done. Again, one, through the open process with um, the online portal, and then two, um, a host institution might um, name an individual to their project proposal. Yeah, that's a, so in terms of timing, if you're talking with a university abroad that wants to host you, it sounds like you really first and foremost should get on, try to get on the roster right away before even trying to get them in their project into the system or pushing them to do that. Because what happens if you're not on the roster, they put in their project, they ask for you, and you're not in the system, will it wait for you to get in the system or, or could they go ahead and match it to somebody else? <laughs> That's a really good question. So normally what happens in that case is um, we would confirm with the host institution that that is the individual that they want to serve. Our team would reach out to them, explain the application process, um, and then they would have the opportunity to apply. It's, it's definitely happened where people have then applied and been denied and so they couldn't serve or um, they unfortunately, there just wasn't enough, you know, they, the timing didn't work between the host and that individual. Um, and so then somebody from the roster went ahead and uh, served in their place. So timing is definitely important. And if you're, you're considering this, opportunity because you already have a pre-existing relationship, it definitely doesn't hurt to start the process now. But I would also advise you to keep an open mind um, because really this program is about sparking also uh, new relationships. And so, you know, you would be surprised by how many projects are available 
uh, that don't have anybody matched to them. And that might actually start something completely new in a different part of the world you haven't worked in before. Um, and that can be exciting and can ultimately be more fruitful for you and your career instead of kind of continuing an already existing relationship. So I would also say keep an open mind in that regard. Would you say you probably have a better chance of doing a specialist project if it's not with, I mean, for instance, I, I spent three years in New Zealand and did my PhD there, have all these existing relationships. Um, and I, maybe I try to use a specialist program now to go back. But is that kind of maybe less uh, of interest to the Fulbright program to just keep helping pre-existing relationships versus creating new ones? Um, I'm just curious, like politically, how, like, what's the better, you know, like you said, to be open-minded, is it better to maybe do that? Get into the system, see what's in there first. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it really, because the country competitions are held on a country level, um, it's difficult to speak for all countries. I will say the more competitive the application process for a particular country, the more likely they are really going to assess, um, you know, how impactful is this going to be if this person has already been at that institution a year ago, even if it's not under Fulbright, but under a different program, right. compared to this other project proposal where this would be a brand new relationship. Um, certainly, a lot of times that commissioner embassy is going to want to go with the second option where it's a new relationship. Um, and so that is something to keep in mind. Um, you know, just keep an open mind. I would hate for you to miss out on an opportunity because you're only narrowly focused on the other option, if that makes right, sense. Right, right. And another question now, you said you're you're reviewing these projects on almost like a daily basis. Do, and if I get onto the specialist roster, am I alerted if new projects come into the system that I might be matched to? Or like, do I should I be going in regularly to see what new projects are in there? Yeah, that's a great question. So because um, we do update it so frequently, we don't send you like an automated email each time a new project is uploaded, but approximately one once a month, we will send an email blast to everybody who's on the roster. And we will, within that email, we'll have an updated list of all of the projects that are currently available. So that way it's always kind of at the forefront of your mind. We remind you if you've forgotten about it, but we're very, we're also very conscious that we don't want to spam you at the same right. time um, on a daily basis. Okay, great. And can I see all projects in all countries and all disciplines, or will I only see the ones that match the, the skill sets that I put in? Uh, great question. So you will see all projects for all countries, all disciplines. And one of the reasons is that, as you've probably saw with that previous discipline list, for many of you, you might be thinking, I could actually fit in a couple categories because my work is really cross-cutting. So if you, for example, get on the roster um, for journalism, but a project under education uh, looks very appropriate, you can certainly express interest in that. That's not a problem. Okay. And let's say, let's say I'm working in the field of medicine, uh, but I see a project that's in like uh, deforestation. I have no experience in this topic, but I feel like I could, it's a, it's an area that I've been dying to get into. Maybe I want to do a master's in it or something at some point. Would I be an eligible candidate if I don't have expertise in that? Or uh, is that kind of a long shot then? Yeah, I would say that's a long shot um, because the way the structure of the program where you're really going in kind of a consultancy capacity, there's really the expectation that you already have, you know, a base knowledge in that area to share versus a program that would be more exploratory towards your own interest, which might be more of, you know, kind of the long term research um, scholar program, if that's something that would interest you. Okay. Now, if I do get picked first go to be matched with a project, I'm excited. How much time do I have to between like the time that I'm sort of selected for it and, and when I have to start the project? Um, how much notice is given? Yeah, that's a great question. So it really varies based upon the project. Um, some projects are in response to a specific event, for example, maybe a natural disaster, and they want somebody to come in that, you know, is an expert in helping to, uh, you know, rebuild and reconstruct or assess buildings. Um, and that could be a very quick turnaround. They might submit the project 
it might get approved and they want somebody on the ground in a month, for example. Um, other projects might be well planned out because maybe they want somebody to come and lecture in a future uh, academic term. And so they know, you know, six months, nine months before that occurs. Um, and so you would have quite a bit of lead time. Okay. So it really does depend based upon the project. But the important thing is, again, you would never be forced to do a project that you're in that, you know, doesn't fit with your timeline. Um, if you're selected for a project, but ultimately the timeline issue just doesn't work, you know, there's no black mark against you for being able to participate in future projects. So it really does have to work for everyone. Okay, that's great. And then um, for people that are working in full time jobs, I mean, I think for an academic, you know, doing this kind of stuff is, is sort of part of the part of your kind of world. But if you're working in a full time job, you know, taking two to six weeks off of work may or may not be possible, even if you have an expertise like the person from IBM. Would you be allowed to continue? Let's say you're working full time. Could you continue to be paid by your employer while you're on this? If if somehow the project related to your full time work or would that be a conflict of interest? What's sort of the expectation? Yeah, it's a great question. So the expectation is really that um, you would make yourself available for, you know, approximately a 40 hour work week while you're there working on project related tasks. Now, if you spend your evenings then catching up on your work from back in the States or on the weekends, you know, certainly that is your prerogative. Um, but it, it's really important to note that Again, going back to the finances of this, the host institutions are putting in also their own financial funds. And so they really do want kind of your your focus during the day when project activities should be happening. Um, and it shouldn't, you know, your other employment really shouldn't interfere with that. Okay. And also, does the Fulbright program, um, let's say you have no international experience, you're going to someplace like Algeria, do you provide any cultural orientation as to what we should know before we go up for that specific country or does the embassy help with that? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's really dependent on the country because the Fulbright Commission or the U.S. Embassy for that country will be helping you to adjust. And it really it tends to depend on that country. For those that um, like Algeria or Pakistan, some of those countries where maybe there's a lot of misperceptions, especially around safety and security. Um, we just recently sent a couple of specialists to Nigeria, for example. Um, for those countries, there tends to be, um, I would say, kind of more robust um, communication and preparation between the embassy um, or the Fulbright Commission and the specialist before they depart. So, for example, a lot of those countries, we would make sure that you had a security briefing uh, before you departed. Um, we would make sure that you're well connected to those entities prior to departure so that you could ask any of those really important questions. Um, we always make sure that you know all of your accommodations before you arrive, who's picking you up at the airport, all of those logistical concerns. Um, so certainly the Embassy and Fulbright Commission have an important role in, in preparing you for your departure. Um, on top of that, we also find that the host institutions also are really wonderful you know, uh, resources um, and kind of wealth of information for that particular um, city that you might be going to or that particular context and really helping prepare you. Um, and so it's a combination of those individuals supporting you, but then also, of course, you know, I really recommend that the specialist also kind of takes some ownership of doing research and preparing themselves as well for the country context. Great. Actually, I just realized, so there's, uh, we have two minutes, but this is going to go over a bit. So, but I'm recording for any of you that for, you know, have to go off so you can access the recording later. Um, I want to get into the questions that are being posted, if that's okay with you, unless there's any big things maybe we haven't discussed yet. I think you're close to the end of your slides here. I don't think so. Um, okay. I can just say maybe while you're looking through those questions, um, if you're curious what happens after you're matched to a project, uh, we're learning one of our staff members would get in touch with you at that point, you know, share our congratulations, and then you would have a, 
uh, a team of two people who would be with you kind of through your full grant cycle. So they would be helping you with your program forms. They would be arranging your international travel, distributing your honorarium payment. And then they also really help to monitor your experience while you're in country. So we confirm your safe arrival. Uh, we conduct at least one monitoring call with you while you're in country just to check in and make sure that no challenges have arisen, whether that's you know logistics, programmatic, or health-wise. Um, and we become available to you 24-7. So if you do have an emergency, not only can you reach out to the local U.S. Embassy or Fulbright Commission, um, but you'll have all of our contact information. Um, and we can obviously um, be that kind of coordinator of support role for you. Oh, that's um, awesome. There really is really great support for grantees while they're on the program. That's incredible. That's like more than most <laughs> programs. So that's awesome. Um, okay, let me get into some questions. There's some good ones here. Um, someone asked, uh, when we were talking about, you know, creating new connections versus, uh, maybe something, someone that you have a pre-existing relationship with, can you apply to continue a specific project, um, as, as your project, um, like maybe you've already been working on something for a year or two, uh, could the Fulbright specialist program be a way to sort of continue that relationship? You, you can certainly try. So you can certainly apply and explain why, um, you know, what's the specific goals and what are the really defined tasks that would be carried out. Um, but just keep in mind, again, that the heart of this program is really to kind of spark new activities. So depending on what other project proposals that Fulbright Commissioner U.S. Embassy is receiving for that country, that sort of structure may be less competitive. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Okay, great. Uh, here's a good question. Now, in terms of the rolling basis for applying to be on the roster, uh, what can you? Is there a turnaround for final decisions, or when can you apply, and when do you hear if you're on the roster? Yeah, absolutely. Let me go back to that slide here. Um, so the next application deadline is January 9th, and if you apply by January 9th, you will receive your decision on February 15th. Great. And if you don't get in that round, could you try again or is there, you can, yeah. Yes, absolutely. So you can apply twice within a 12 month period. Oh, good to know. Um, so you could apply right away again by March 6th. Um, and one thing we do, because it is an online application process, excuse me, if you do decide to reapply, um, you can be in contact with our staff and we can basically release your previous application back to you so that you can then make edits without having to start from scratch. Do you get feedback on that or why it was rejected? So typically we do not provide um, specific feedback from the peer review panels, but our team is always available to kind of serve in a consultancy capacity where we can take a look at the application and say, you know, in general, here are some things you might want to, to strengthen based upon some of the macro trends that we're seeing. Um, but th that's kind of the extent of the feedback that's available. But I will say as well, if somebody does reapply, we always send your new dossier or application to a separate panel with three new panelists um, to avoid any sort of bias for the fact that, you know, of the previous decision. Oh, that's good to know. Actually, and the next person had asked about competitiveness. So here's a question. Is there a limited number of spots in each round or each year? Or if everyone's excellent, will everyone potentially get on? That's a great question. So yes, there is no maximum number of individuals that are permitted to join the roster each year. So you're really, in a sense, competing against yourself as opposed to, um, you know, a certain selection of individuals. Okay. And what are, um, in terms of, okay, I always like to do insider strategies through <laughs> fellow. Are there any particular application deadlines where you wish you've got more applicants versus other deadlines where you get maybe too many? That's such a great question. You know, it's so funny. Um, it is remarkably stable, the number okay. of applications that we receive for each deadline. Um, there is maybe 5%, 10% variance, um, but it is remarkably stable. So okay. there's unfortunately no advantage. I didn't know if there was any seasonal title. changes, you know, <laughs> seasonal changes in deadlines can be, can happen. Um, oh, here's a question too. And what are you looking for in terms of 
professional recommendations? What do you want to see in those letters and, and comments? Yeah. So, I mean, I think just like any job that you might be applying for, I think the most impactful ones are um, going to be from if you have supervisors who would be willing to write it. Um, I know sometimes the peer review panels, if all of your references are coming from colleagues, you know, they might take that with a little bit of a grain of salt versus somebody who is responsible for assessing your work um, instead of just a peer capacity. Uh, capacity. So I would uh, recommend to the extent possible to try to make sure that you at least have one or two supervisors as part of that mix. Um, and what they are assessing you on are things like you know, dependability, adaptability, uh, your communication style, um, your ability to take direction, um, you know, what is their assessment of your, you know, your knowledge base. And um, so it's very calm, you know, it's, it's everything that you would probably expect it to be. In a normal, yeah. But it sounds like it would be good to have maybe some diversity among the people that you have writing. So rather than just two people that you are on your team, maybe a supervisor, maybe an academic person, maybe someone from a volunteer work that you do, just to kind of round it out a bit, right? Absolutely. Okay, great, let me, uh, let's see. Can you see, is it possible to find out uh, anywhere on the site where else people have, where institutions that have hosted uh, specials before? I mean, although I don't know if that matters too much because you gotta get into the system and see who's offering projects, but. Maybe if you're trying to set up a new one, maybe you want to see if this university in Cologne has, have they hosted someone before? Is that possible to find out? Yeah, so there's two places on our website that I would direct you to. Um, I'll go back here to the web address here at fulbrightspecialist.worldlearning.org. Um, the first is one of the links on our page is called Making an Impact. And on that page, we highlight recently returned specialists and we talk about uh, the project that they did in the field and then what sort of impact or follow on linkages have come out of that. Um, and so that will just kind of give you a taste and a flavor for the types of projects that have been recently carried out and the types of host institutions. Um, and then in addition, we also on our website, we also have, it's called the Fulbright Specialist Directory. And that starts in 2017. And it will show you a list of um, individuals in the US who have participated in the program. And it will show you what their host institution was abroad. Um, as well as their home institution in the U.S. And so that might be nice because you might see if somebody from your current employer uh, is an alum, and that might be a way for you to connect with somebody who recently took part in the program. And again, we'll also give you just kind of a broader view of the types of host institutions that are supporting specialists. Oh, that's great. And I think people should keep in mind, too, with universities, um, for those of you that maybe are not really in-depth uh, in ac academia, Often a department in a single university may have no idea of what another, a different department in the university is doing. So the Department of Engineering might have hosted a Fulbright specialist, but the, but the School of Arts and Sciences has not, and they probably wouldn't know that. So um, if you see that a university has hosted somebody, uh, also check the department, because that wouldn't necessarily mean that university department that you're trying to connect with <laughs> is in the system or knows. So um, they usually are very siloed. Um, someone asked, how are projects which overlap two of the listed categories evaluated? So two different disciplines. Yeah, so um, in terms of the projects themselves, um, each discipline, when you select it, then the host institution also selects different specializations within that discipline. Um, and then they get to uh, further articulate the exact activities um, and several essays that they write as part of their project application. Um, I think sometimes uh, people, whether it's a host institutions or even specialist applicants who are applying, get a little bit hung up on the disciplines. And I would say, it's really a way for State Department to help categorize projects versus, 
you know, whether or not somebody's qualified if they're under engineering education versus education. Um, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, but if you do have any questions, um, especially in regards to your own specialist application, you can always feel free to reach out to our general inbox here. And our team is also happy to help guide you of which discipline might be best for you, just based upon macro uh, kind of trends and who's typically falling under which category. Okay, great. Um, someone had asked, I think we kind of covered this, but can you re-up for another project after completing the first one? Well, actually, this is a question. You can do more than one project as a specialist. And how long are you on the roster to be eligible? That's a really great question. So you receive a tenure of three years, uh, which um, was changed by the State Department about a year and a half ago. It was previously five years. So if you're thinking to yourself, I thought it was five, you're not going crazy, that was a, um, an older policy. But uh, right now, the State Department does require a two-year waiting period between specialist grants. So in theory, you could do two grants during one tenure period. You would have to do one in year one and then one in year three. Okay. So that's something to keep in mind. And then after your roster tenure has ended, if you want to reapply to join, you just have to observe um, a two year waiting period and then you'll be eligible again to reapply to join the roster and then potentially do another grant. Okay, great. Oh, and another question uh, I had from someone else. If you've done a Fulbright U.S. Student Award or a Fulbright Scholar Award or any of uh, even the Fulbright Specialty Awards, are you still eligible to do the specialist program? Yes, great question. You are absolutely still eligible. Um, previously in the past, there were some eligibility restrictions between the programs, um, but this is also a recent change of about a year and a half ago where the State Department uh, finally split all of the eligibility. So um, we only assess you in terms of the specialist program. You can absolutely apply for both the specialist, the scholar, the student program. Um, you can do it at the same time. The only thing I would hesitate is, you know, if you did receive a scholar award or a student award and you were currently abroad, it's unlikely that the State Department would permit you to then do a specialist grant during that period because then you'd be kind of double dipping between two programs. But aside from that, you can absolutely apply and there's there's no conflict there. That's great. And I did see the other thing that if you've been living abroad for the last five years or more than five years that you wouldn't be eligible. Correct. And really kind of the basis for that State Department policy is, you know, even though these projects are driven by the host institutions and they're really helping to serve their priorities and goals, um, you know, the State Department really does believe and we all, you know, share this belief that this these programs really are impactful for the U.S. as well. And they really want individuals who are returning to the U.S. and are going to share their new knowledge and skills um, with their institutions or with their colleagues here in the U.S. And so if you're currently have been living abroad for five or more years, um, the impact for Fulbright, um, it's harder to, to see that uh, materialize in the U.S. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to end in just a few minutes at the 15 after the hour. So I'm going to take one last great question. If um, And this was kind of just going back um, for what are the peer reviewers looking for in applicants? Like what would you say are the top three things that are most important um, when you're you're when you're basically describing who you are and and why you should get into this roster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, a clearly articulated vision for what are the type of activities that you could do. Um, and clearly articulated vision of, of how you're going to support that host institution, um, how you're going to be able to uh, share this information and to further their goals. I think sometimes people get a little bit caught up because they focus it too much on how it's going to further their career and mm -hmm. 
then it gets a little bit muddied about whether or not you truly understand the structure of this program. Um, so I think that's one thing to look out for. Um, the other thing, again, is just, I think, really articulating how can you be successful in a cross-cultural environment? Um, and even if you haven't previously worked internationally, just really thinking through what are those strategies that you would employ? I think all of us who have worked abroad understand um, the high potential for miscommunication. And, um, and so just being able to really show that you've been thoughtful about how you could be successful in that sort of climate and environment is important. And um, again, I really just go back to the essays. I just think that those are so important to show that you understand the program. Um, I guess one other thing I would say is we do get a lot of individuals who are retired. Um, and one of the essays also focuses on, you know, what impact might your participation bring to your U.S. employer or institution? Um, and persons who are retired might get tripped up about that. And what I would encourage people in that scenario is to really think broadly. Um, what might your experience impact the U.S.? That's not necessarily a traditional employer. Uh, so, for example, we've had people talk about, you know, their membership in a rotary group, for example, and how when they return, they're going to share that experience with those individuals. And so I think you can think really creatively um, about what other sort of special interest groups are you still involved with, even if you don't have a traditional employer in the U.S. That is really, really good advice, because, again, these are things, you know, you don't see any instructions anywhere about that. Um, so I just want to thank you for really helping us get into the nitty gritty of what this program is about, how you can be a competitive applicant and, and have a chance at one of these extraordinary um, opportunities to, to work with a group abroad. And um, maybe if you could just put up the last slide with your email address again, I'm going to post this, everyone, inside the network um, as well, uh, just so that you can always contact Jessica. Does this go to you, Jessica, or is it kind of a to a bunch um, of people? It will go to our, it will, it will go to our team, um, but we'll make sure that any of your inquiries get answered for sure. Okay, great. And I, and I would love to hear if any of you actually ended up applying and getting on the roster. It would be uh, wonderful to hear. And I also just want to put a plug inside the Profello member network. We're doing a recommendation letter um, uh, workshop on Friday at 12 noon, which will also be recorded. But if you participate, we're going to go into in depth about how you ask for recommendation letters and get those diverse letters, um, which sounds like it would be an important element for a program like this um, so that you're not just asking a couple of team members to write them. But how do you really get your recommendations to tell about your adaptability, your cultural competence, um, and really that you're gonna be a great candidate for this program. So we hope you'll join us for that too. But in any case, thank you, Jessica, so much for your time today. Uh, we had, it was up to 25 people or so watching the stream. And I know a lot more are gonna be watching uh, the recording be because they could not make this particular time. So thank you for your time and um, you know, let's stay in touch. All right. Thanks, Vicki. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. I hope uh, best of luck to you, and I, I hope we'll get some applications. Great. Thanks so much. Take care. I'm going to end the Bye. meeting now. Bye-bye.